Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming. I'm Raj McCormack, uh, the Director of Education here at the Bronx County Historical Society uh, for another um, another of our virtual book talks on Bronx history. And I'm very pleased to introduce John O'Leary, who has written a really wonderful book on the Reuters coach work that was a classic car restoration shop on Boston Post Road. And they did a number of really excellent work on Woodrow Wilson's cars and Franklin Roosevelt's. And it's really a really wonderful uh, Bronx tale. And I'm very pleased to have John here to uh, tell us and to show us pictures of, from the from the, from the the coach work. So, John, take it away. Thank you for coming. Thanks. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, I'm really excited to uh, present the uh, research on Reuters Coach Works. Um, so we'll get started. What you're looking at first, um, this is a 1940 tax photo. Um, in 1940, the city took a picture of every business and residence for tax purposes. Um, and what's uh, interesting about this is uh, each place has one shot. So some could be to the side, it could be at an angle, it could be blurry. Um, but I had to go down to Chamber Street to get it. They've, I think, since um, uh, digitized the, the 1940 stuff. But this is the actual shot of the shop um, and the... Uh, the apartment where they live behind it. So it's not grandiose, it's kind of nondescript, but uh, some uh, consider this the uh, best automobile res restoration shop in the United States. Um, as a closer up, you'll see, um, you can re read the word Simonize uh, on the on the wall. Uh, you can also see, it's a little blurry, but it says Gus Reiter on the door here. This was the door to the office as you go in. Um, and again, they lived in the apartment behind the shop. Um, so again, just a great photo. I remember uh, screaming with excitement uh, on Chamber Street when I found it, because uh, there was again, there's no guarantee it was there. Uh, another angle of it uh, looks like it's kind of like snowing because it's on that old acetate film. It's before the 35 millimeter, so it is deteriorating. So hopefully they're able to digitize a lot of the stuff for the rest of the borough um, sooner rather than later. Uh, another close up look of, of the shop. Uh, this will be Gus here on the left, Gus Sr. You'll see it says auto body uh, repairing in the glass, uh, fender and collision works. Again, Reuters Coach Works up top. Um, they did kind of everything, um, top and slip covers, painting, body work, you name it, they they, they did it. Uh, and you'll see it says 4067 here and then Gus Reuter on the uh, on the window again, a little clearer shot of that. Uh, again, just another personal shot from the family. Um, of, of the business, uh, kind of a twilight here. Uh, so again, it's not anything grandiose. There's not six levels. It was two bays of the garage. Um, and they did some real impressive work with it. You can see set of the, the door on the side here. Um, this is a, a board ward um, car, German car that was out front of the shop here. Um, you'll also get a great shot of American Spring and Welding that was next, the business next door. Um, it was at 4075, um, again, just another part of uh, Bronx history that's no longer there, but uh, the, the photos like this, uh, I paint a picture of, of what was once there. Uh, and this is the tag everyone wanted to see on their car. Um, so if you're fortunate enough to book an appointment with Gus and get uh, work done um, uh, on your car, you would have had this tag on it. And nowadays, if these cars come to auctions uh, and, you know, Sotheby's or any of these auctions and it has this tag on it, uh, the price tends to go up. Um, this is a interesting a postcard I found years ago. So American Spring Welding on the on the right, and then Reuters Coachworks on the left here. So you'll see the sign. It's been painted. It's painted red and white. Um, it's really the only color photo I've seen of it. Most of this, the stuff I have is black and white. Uh, but just you never know where you'll find things uh, when you're looking for uh, for old photos. Again, a uh, wider shot of it. Uh, the American Spring Welding, uh, and then Reuters Coachworks to the left with a tele with a light pole, uh, kind of in between them here. So this is Gus Sr. Um, let's see, he um, uh, he's 29 uh, in 1906 when he uh, immigrates to the United States. Um, he worked for uh, several different um, coach makers uh, over the years when he first gets in. He worked for Brewster, uh, Carriage Works, uh, and Go Gotham Auto Body. Um, so this is a, his actual uh, 1918, um, I think it's his registration for the war card. Um, because he was not American, he was German, he was required to fill out uh, a card to the city. Uh, and there's, we still have it, the family still has it, it was gracious enough to turn it over to me. Um, so you'll see here, he actually lived uh, at 176th Street in the Bronx um, before they moved into the shop here. Um, see his birth date, where he's from, he lists Gotham Auto Body as his employer uh, and automobile trimmers as occupation. Again, just another interesting piece of, uh, of history here. 
Uh, this is Gus Sr. coming out of that door um, to head into his car, you know, maybe on the weekend when he's off, um, heading out somewhere to enjoy the day. Um, this is him and his wife, Lena. See outside. He decides uh, at the ripe old age of 50 uh, in 1929 that he's going to open a shop for himself. Um, it's, uh, you know, kind of a bold move in the uh, late 20s during the Depression to do this. Um, but he decides he's got enough experience um, that he's going to take a stab at it. Um, and through, you know, experience and good fortune, it turns out well for him. Uh, this is actually his, uh, he becomes a citizen in 1951. This is his naturalization paperwork. I'd never seen this before. Again, I think this is kind of cool how it lists um, his dependents, where he's from. Um, again, it's in the Bronx, uh, Bronx County uh, in 1951. So this is Gus at, at work on a uh, 1902 Olds. Um, again, anything he seemed to touch turned to gold. He had the uh, kind of the Midas touch, as you would call it. Um, I mean, people couldn't wait for him to uh, kind of touch up their work. Uh, he's putting the, the, the finishing touches on this now, but this would have come in with needing paintwork or this brass re-polished or, um, or repaired the tires, anything uh, that they would have done. Uh, and this is him, Gus Sr. outside. I'm not sure exactly what this car is. I'm still working on that one. Uh, but a great shot of him, uh, Gus Sr., outside the uh, outside the shop. Uh, this is an old ad uh, from the Bulb Horn from 1954. Uh, this is, uh, you know, coach work, listing the address. Again, it's we are equipped to do all kind of body, leather, top, and paint work required for antique automobiles or sports cars. So no, no, no job too big or small for him. Uh, again, I kind of like this one. It's uh, it's his ad next to uh, Henry Austin Clark's Long Island Automotive Museum. Uh, this Stutz, Stutz actually comes into the shop. Uh, Henry Austin Clark uh, winds up becoming a client, as I'll go over in a little bit. Uh, but just interesting that interesting that their ads are uh, right next to each other. Uh, again, this is from the 1950 issue of Bold Porn Magazine. Uh, came across this years ago. This is uh, in old, old, one of his old business cards. I didn't think I'd ever see this. Uh, this is probably the only one that's left. Um, again, it's a great uh, piece of, you know, ephemera that was probably never meant to be kept, meant to be handed out to clients or potential clients um, and, you know, never to be seen again or, you know, just call the phone number uh, if you needed his services. But great, nice little uh, little uh, monogram up top there with the, the auto painting uh, and his uh, his address in the Bronx. Uh, this is Gus Sr. Uh, hard at work. Again, nothing really kind of organized. Everything's... Uh, uh, kind of all over the place, but that's how they did it. They got it done. They really didn't have a system. There was just boxes everywhere and upholstery. But he, he always found it getting the best, getting the best stuff, getting the best best leathers, getting the paint just right. You'll see up above here on his left shoulder, there's a couple of windows. Um, and the story goes that uh, they would hand sandwiches to the guys uh, during the day, so they wouldn't have to take a you know a long lunch break. They'd just hand him food uh, through the windows into the shop. Uh, again, another shot of Gus Senior working on some kind of leather here. Um, again, his, his work was just the best, uh, really highly sought after. Uh, and again, once once word got out, um, just the, the cars that came in here, just kind of one of one, really unique uh, and still last to this day. Um, this is Gus and his son, Gus Jr. I'm not sure what car they're working on here. It's a little blurry uh, and they've got it's kind of the distinguishing marks covered. Uh, I can't see any um, marquee names or anything on there. Um, but it's just another great shot of them them uh, at work in the shop. Um, he's actually featured in the Auto Trim News Magazine in 1953. Uh, he's considered he called they call him the Dean of Trimmers. Uh, as you see here in the right hand corner, um, again just another nod to the, the incredible work that he does um, in, in the uh, um, the lengths that he'll go to make sure that the job's done right. Uh, and again, him, his, him at the sewing machine, really nothing he can't do, kind of a jack of all trades. Whatever needs to get done, he'll get it done to make sure the car uh, is is suited to the customer's specifications. Um, I really like this shot. This is Gus walking down the street um, uh, and you see Duffy's Tavern behind him. I'd always heard stories of Duffy's um, that go there after work or something, but most of the pictures I have are looking the other way down the street. So you see the Shell station, looks like a Texaco, but I don't see uh, going this way towards Duffy's until I found this photo. So this is actually a white automobile, but it's looking the other way. And you can clearly see the Duffy's Tavern sign here. It's a great color shot. Um, it's American Brake Company on the other side. So you had American Spring Welding and American Brake Company flanking the coachworks here. Uh, and then you've got Duffy's, you know, it's what is this, 100 feet down the road. It's really not that far away. But again, it's a great shot looking the other way away from the coachworks where most of the shots uh, you see the building or American Spring Welding. 
Um, this is, you're looking at Zumbach Motors uh, in Manhattan. Uh, Zumbach was originally the um, uh, only Mercedes dealership repair service. Um, and what would happen is over the years that they would want up kicking uh, some clients to Gus. I think because Gus knew so many people that either worked for Zumbach or knew Zumbach himself, um, that over the years they would um, that they would send him some work. And the story goes that one day, uh, one of the Zumbach employees, what would happen is they'd give it to Gus, Gus would work on it, they'd get Gus's bill and Zumbach would just double it. So one day, one of the customers, they didn't take the uh, the bill out of the, uh, Gus's bill out of the glove box. So when the customer saw that uh, it was half of what Zumbach was charging, he went right to the horse's mouth himself. Uh, and that person was Alec Ullman. So Alec Ullman is the uh, pioneer of sports car and road racing in North America. Uh, he founds the Sebring um, a Grand Prix endurance race in Florida. Uh, he's in, living in Connecticut. You'll see his Connecticut vanity license plate that says Alec here. See the coach works and American Swim only behind him. Uh, again, this car, after it's after it's done, after it's repaired, is featured in uh, popular, popular Science. Again, you'll see that Alec Connecticut license plate on it. Um, again, just an interesting uh, comparison of uh, what, what, what kind of work comes out of the shop. Uh, another one of uh, Ullman's cars, it's harder to see, the license plate is faded, but it's U-L-M-N. It was Alec Ullman's other Connecticut vanity plate. Uh, this is a 1914 uh, Rolls-Royce Silver Ghost. Um, so again, most of these the pictures I have are of the coach work looking towards American Spring Welding, not, not down the street. Um, the, uh, the, the One of the great quotes I've heard about Gus is from James Melton. Uh, it's, it's in his 1954 book, Bright Wheels Rolling. Uh, he says, indeed, there are a few professionals who can do diamond pleating as it was done in 1910, or paint a car so that you can look right down into the finish and not see bubbles, orange peels, or scratches. Uh, Gus Reiter of New York does this work better than anyone I know. So again, he mentions him by name in his book, uh, Bright Wheels Rolling. So you might be asking, who's James Melton? I did the same thing. Uh, James Melton is kind of the first uh, multimedia star. Uh, he's a metropolitan opera singer uh, in New York. He has a radio show. He's an actor. He's in the movies. Um, he's kind of akin to uh, what you uh, we could maybe compare him to Jay Leno now, a uh, high profile entertainer who has a big, big passion for cars. Uh, Melton also loves automobiles. Um, he sent Gus this picture and it says, uh, to my good friend, Gus, a great guy with warmest regards, Jim. Um, one of the uh, stories I've heard from Melton's daughter is that he, she always wondered where her dad was on Christmas Eve and he'd always be down in the Bronx um, singing uh, to the Reuter family, having a drink with Gus. So my in-laws, my father-in-law and his brother always thought that, you know, having an award-winning metropolitan uh, music star singing uh, Christmas carols at your house was kind of commonplace growing up. Um, and so uh, Ullman, Alec Ullman knows Melton, introduces him to Gus, um, and from there it gets rolling. This is uh, Melton's uh, Peugeot skiff that's up at uh, Seal Cove in, um, in uh, Maine. Uh, and there's a, a letter with it um, that says uh, from years ago that they they brought this car to Reuters Co uh, Coachworks in the Bronx. I don't have any pictures of it, but again, it's just one of these kind of, you know, history dating the car, um, people telling stories where they brought it to. And Gus is mentioned by name in the story. So it did come through the Bronx at some point, and it's now up in Maine. Um, this is uh, James Melton's 1905 white steamer. And this was the condition that it it was in when he sent it to the Bronx to have Gus work on it. Again, it's kind of in bad shape. Um, it's kind of uh, beat up, missing up a bunch of things. Um, but when it's done, this is what it looks like. So this uh, Melton has this shipped to the Autorama in Florida. Um, and again, this uh, one on top, it's not a spare uh, tire, it's actually a hat box. But if you look at the ornate uh, upholstery, uh, again, the brass work, everything else, Gus really did a, a class job with this one, considering it was in such rough shape um, when he first got it. Um, this is Milton's 1908 Packard Roadster. Um, here it is coming into the shop. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have any, um, you know, like uh, receipts or anything to say exactly what was done. Um, but we all know it, these weren't coming into the shop just for, uh, uh, you know, photo ops. Gus couldn't afford that. So uh, there was work to be done on all these cars. Uh, and again, this is the this is the result. Uh, because Melton was such a good client to or customer to uh, to Gus, Gus made a, a Reuter red color for him. And this is it on the Packard. Um, so again, this is being displayed down at the uh, Autorama in Florida. Uh, another one of his cars is the Curb Dash Olds. Uh, it's got the half Connecticut license plate. Again, Melton had a bunch of vanity plates on it uh, on his cars as well. 
Um, and this is a great shot of, of the half and then the carrier is pint. So it's half pint. Um, I'd never seen this before. Again, it's another great shot of how Melton would bring the cars around everywhere uh, and bring them into the Bronx. And here it is uh, at the coachwork. So you'll see it's missing a, uh, a light here. I don't know if that's being polished or replaced. Uh, but again, all these cars came down here to to, to have work on. Uh, interesting one is this is uh, um, Melton's uh, 1937 Packard with a Pierce Aero body. Again, this is the sh the shape that it uh, it kind of came in when it got down to the Bronx, uh, and then when it's done, this is what it looks like. So again, you'll see the the Connecticut vanity plate. It's Mrs. Melton for Mrs. M on the corner there, um, and again, it's you know it's just a class job that 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 is done. By, by Gus in the Bronx. Um, so not only does Allman know James Melton, he knows Briggs Cunningham. So Briggs Cunningham, another you know American sportsman, uh, sportsman yachtsman, um, living in Connecticut at the time. Um, so he decides he's going to send some uh, cars down to Gus. Uh, this is actually one of the uh, Cunningham, the C3 car. Uh, it's coming in. I'm not sure what was done to this car, because um, again, this was Cunningham's own line of cars. Uh, I don't know if it was repainted or whatever, but some work was done. I just don't know which one it is either. There's no, I can't read the plates on it, no distinguishing marks. So uh, I'm still looking into that one. Uh, one of the interesting ones, this is the uh, um, um, Briggs Cunningham's Bugatti Royale. Uh, there's only six Royales ever made. Uh, Cunningham gets the deal of the lifetime uh, after, shortly after World War II. He trades uh, Bugatti uh was it five hundred dollars and two working refrigerators, which were uh, hard to come by after the war, uh, for two um, Bugattis? He sells um, Briggs sells one and keeps this one. This was the Kellner car, um, and winds up sending it. Um, he uh, it sold at auction in eighty seven, but when he first gets it, uh, ships it down to the Bronx. So it's interesting. It's still wearing the European license plate on it. Again, I'm not sure exactly what was done. Is it painted? Is upholstery done? Uh, but again, these cars didn't just come here uh, for photo ops. Um, so I can't say with certainty what was actually done to the car, but uh, some work was done. on it. And again, we know it was here through the great uh, photographic record of uh, of the uh, of the coachworks in the Bronx. Uh, another interesting one is the um, the short wheeled uh, Duesenberg. This was owned by Gary Cooper years ago. Uh, this went to auction a few years back. It became the highest selling American car of all time. Um, I think it was from the Revs Institute that sold it. Um, here's another picture of it at the auction house. Uh, but at the time, um, um, years ago, Briggs Cunningham also owned this car. <clears throat> and you'll see it's got the doozy Connecticut license plate. Here it is uh, at Henry Austin Clark's place at the Long Island Auto Museum. Uh, another close-up of the car of the plate. And then here it is in uh, the coachwork. So it's kind of hard to see this one. Uh, but this is the, the left... Uh, left rear fender and you'll see it's the connect the plate here is d-u-s-y so it's doozy this is this is the car uh again just not sure what was done to it um was it painted is there an upholstery done does he need something done uh, i'm still trying to look into that one maybe uh the cunningham museum has something on that and then behind it is actually the uh pierce arrow silver arrow which i'll uh, have a, a another shot of uh of later Again, it's just a close up of that doozy license, Connecticut license plate showing that's the uh, the short wheelbase Duesenberg. And here it is uh, when it was done. Uh, again, the doozy plate on it. Just can't tell you, you know, what was specifically was done. Wish I could. Um, Gus didn't have the greatest record keeping, but when you have clients like Briggs and Melton, <laughs> you don't need uh, you don't you're not you're not without work long. So there's you know always work to be done uh, and didn't need to uh, didn't have the greatest record keeping. Uh, another great quote from Henry Austin Clark, who ran the uh, Long Island Auto Museum. Uh, he says, uh, if I had to take uh, out of my collection all the Reuter restored cars, I'd be in bad shape. So here's Henry Austin Clark, uh, again, um, another automobile enthusiast. Um, this is his Long Island Auto Museum. They've recently uh, rebuilt the yurt here, the, this Quonset style hut uh, out on Southampton. It was torn down due to structural problems. But the new owner of the business has kind of made an homage to this and rebuilt it out in Southampton, which is kind of nice. Um, this is the 1910 White. Uh, this is one of Gus's favorite cars that he said he ever worked on. Uh, this is Austin Clark. Uh, this is outside the Long Island Auto Museum. I don't have any pictures of it in the shop, but just through literature I've read, it was one of Gus's favorite cars to work on. Uh, this is the 1904 Franklin that uh, Austin Clark had. This is inside the uh, Auto Muse Long Island Auto Museum. Um, and here it is in the shop in the Bronx. So again, was it painted? Um, 
but we there, it was here for work. Uh, it wasn't here just to be looked at. So it's just another you know record of what other cars were here uh, over the years. Uh, this is Henry Austin Clark's 1916 Pierce Arrow, uh, again, being prepped for something. Uh, just, again, another incredible car that's here in the shop. Um, and, again, you look at the ornate, some of the, the windows here. Again, there was cinder blocks. It was not a, you know, not a lot of OSHA regulations on this one. There was not a lot of, um, you know, uh, you know, fritz or pop and circumstance. All that stuff went into the cars. So there was not a lot of, uh, you know, work put into uh the shop itself it was the, it was all focused on the cars uh this is uh, gus senior with uh austin clark's uh two cycle uh, model a ford um that was here for something so i'm fooling around with it having a good time uh down in the bronx this is the uh 1933 uh pierce arrow silver arrow uh this was made for the 1933 uh world's fair uh only five of these cars i think were made and i think only three survived um, so this came from the Cameron Peck collection. The Austin Clark bought it, shipped it down to Gus. Uh, again, you see it's a tight space. So that other short wheel Duesenberg is here. There's not a lot of room to move around. You can't get like eight or nine cars in here. It's two, I think, max. Um, but this is the condition that that Silver Arrow came in. Again, not good. Um, it was all beat up. Uh, paint was a mess. Windows were needed to be replaced. Uh, it's just scuffed. Fend you'll see the, you see the fender was bent down here. Um, Another side of it, again, you'll see it was all scuffed. I'm sure it's being marked um, stuff for paint now, but just in really, really rough condition. Uh, and then this is me with the car in 2015 when it sold at auction. Uh, again, you'll see what a great job Gus wound up doing, uh, you know, getting that car back into shape, uh, the fenders, the color, um, just real, real and world-class job with it. Uh, this is the 1906 uh, Mercedes uh, owned by Robert Greer, another uh New York um, collector. Uh, this is another unique automobile that, again, his vanity plate here for New York. Um, the, here it is outside of the uh, the Bronx. You notice that the the um, the tires say no skid on. Them. That was the big thing for Firestone. It was the imprint was no skid, so they wouldn't skid on you. Um, what I really like about this is that the the coachworks or the fender and collision reflects here in the water uh, that was on the ground. Looks like this was taken. I think it was in March of '49. So there's still a little snow on the ground here. Um, and then this is Gus Sr., Gus Jr. with that uh, Robert Kears Mercedes outside of the Coachworks. Um, again, they didn't take pictures of every car. This one they did. Uh, wish I had some more stories from Gus to tell me why. Um, but it's one of those things maybe I'll, I'll learn over the years. Um, I really like some of the paperwork that the, uh, um, the family saved. So this is actually the uh, birth certificate for Gus Jr. Uh, so this is 1922. Again, you'll see he was born uh, in the Bronx. Uh, mother's name is Lena, uh, July 11, 1922. Again, so, so these things are hard to come by, especially the originals, unless they're filed with the city. But even that, you get a uh, you know a photocopy or something of it. So this is actually the original birth certificate. Uh, this, so this is Gus Jr. Um, he attends um, Evander Childs High School in the Bronx. Uh, he graduates in 1941. And here's his, uh, his diploma. Um, which is another interesting uh, piece of history. Again, it's the original diploma. Um, they kept it over the years. Uh, again, it's just a really nice thing to have January 1941. Uh, so as Gus grows up, again, they live behind the, uh, Gus Jr. grows up, they, they live behind the shop. So this is that entrance to the door. They would have lived above it, left his shoes uh, and the socks. Uh, maybe he's going to a dance or something, um, but uh, real sharp looking. Uh, again, and then he was a big baseball fan. So they had a post-road baseball team in the Bronx. Uh, I wish I knew the record. I don't know if this was like a, just a kind of a fun neighborhood league, uh, but I love the uniform um, and um, just a great shot of, you know, leisure stuff outside of work. Uh, again, him with a couple of friends, um, either before or after uh, a game to celebrate. Uh, so uh, Gus Jr., after he graduates from high school, uh, he works for his father for a little while, and then he joins the uh, service uh, during World War II, um, he does train, uh, training for aerial gunners. He's sent out to, um, uh, where is this one? I think this is Texas, uh, Buckingham Army Airfield. I think it's Texas. Um, to double check that one. Uh, again, this is a group shot uh, of him and, uh, and his squad. Uh, again, just nice from uh, over the years from uh, his service time. Uh, and then a great shot uh, of him during uh, his service uh, to the country during the war. Uh, so after the war, uh, he com comes back, um, he starts a family, 
So this is uh, Gus Sr. here with the hat, Gus Jr. That's Gus's wife, uh, Eleanor. Uh, this is actually my father-in-law, Richard Reuter. And this is uh, Richard's younger brother, Robert Reuter. Uh, so this is the whole Reuter family here outside of the shop. Uh, great family photo. Uh, so um, as Gus Jr. gets older, starts a family, they move on to Dyer Ave. So this is, uh, they lived on the second floor here. This is 3805 Dyer Ave in the Bronx. Um, I believe it was the in the middle here that they, they, they live in the second floor, um, you know, the meat market. So um, again, my my father-in-law and his brother, this is where they grew up, spent most of their time uh, on Dyer Ave before working for their father. Uh, this is uh, Eleanor, Gus's uh, wife with Rich. Again, another car coming out of the uh, of the shop. Seems like never ending. Uh, seems like all the photos uh, revolve around the shop, but that was the business, so it makes sense. Uh, this is Gus Sr. with Rich, so the grandfather with Rich and a couple of neighborhood friends. I don't know if they're making some kind of a um, model car or something or working on something, but weekend project with uh, the grandfather. Uh, this is Rich with a Stanley Steamer. Um, this is a great shot of him, you know, just showing, you know, the size of the cars um, and, well, you know, growing up around the business. You know, he was he would have been there ever since he was a little kid. Uh, another great quote from another New York collector, Dr. Sam Shear. Uh, it says, I've had dozens of national first prize winning cars of the highest category, and Gus Raider's hands were on every one of them. So Dr. Shear had a real penchant for collecting great cars, shipped them all down to uh, the Bronx. This is a Duesenberg. Um, he wrote, I wrote to Gus with love, Sam. Uh, so he must have won uh, first prize with, with this restoration of this car. Um, this is um, a 1910 Rolls Royce that Dr. Shear had sent down to the um, to the Bronx. Um, this is Gus Jr. here on the far right, uh, Gus Sr., uh, Uncle Eddie's over here on the left, and that's Lena in the middle. Uh, another picture of across the street, there was a Woodworth building supply in the Bronx across the street from the Coach Works, uh, and this is Dr. Shear's 1910 Rolls Royce. You start to see the license plate here on the left. Uh, and another great shot of it here, his MD, he was a doctor. So his plates always ended MD. Most they tried to have the plates end MD, so you know it was, it was his car. It's another great shot of this once it's done uh, here in the Bronx. Uh, and then you'll see this was his award for uh, his 1904 Cadillac that Gus had done. Uh, he won um, that national award for it. That car is actually, or it says to my friend Gus, um, uh, it wasn't, uh, I wouldn't have this prize if it wasn't for you, is what he wrote. Uh, and the car is now actually up at um, Seal Cove again, up in Maine. Uh, so again, still wears that Reuter red color. Uh, great looking car. Gus did an outstanding job on it. And it survives to this day up in uh, up in Maine. Um, I like this. It's a 1961 ad for the Coachworks. Again, because of the clients they had, they really didn't have to advertise a whole lot. Uh, again, they were, weren't without work for too long of a time as word uh, got out. So I love the old uh, phone number. Um, uh, it's nothing that we have today. So I, I always like the, the, the little details on the ads like that. Uh, another uh, client is Ken Purdy. He's the famed automobile writer um, from years ago, from the 60s. Um, he, he once wrote, we agreed on Gus Reuter, whose two-man shop in the Bronx, New York, produces work that cannot be approved upon. So this is uh, Mr. Purdy here. Um, a shot of him. He, again, he was writing for um life magazine and boys life and you know he wrote for playboy at one point he was writing for all the great magazines about different races and automobiles from uh, over the years uh this is mr purdy his bugatti um the, he lived here in connecticut as well um this is what uh are affectionately known to us uh, they're called ken cards so ken would send these postcards out to uh to different people over the years and there's only a handful around still uh i think i have two of them um, but this is the one that we, he was living in uh, London at their England at the time, and he sent it to Gus. Um, it says, have some nice automobiles here. I trust uh, you and your brother. Well, I think of you often. He signs it, Ken. He actually got the address wrong. He sent it to 4037 uh, Boston Ro uh, Post Road of the Bronx, but it got to the right place. I guess the mailman uh, knew who it was. Uh, another, uh, Gus, I mean, Ken was so enamored with Gus. Um, he would send him, you know, copies of books um bright uh the bright wheels rolling book the wonderful world of automobile and he he would um he would inscribe them personally to him uh this first one from 1966 
The next one uh, is great. Um, uh, it says for Gus Ryder, master coach builder, affectionately Ken uh, from 1972. Uh, and because uh, Ken was good friends with Melton, uh, Melton let him have the Ryder red color. So Gus painted his uh, Bugatti, uh, the Ryder red. Um, and this is what it, what, this is what it looked like. Uh, another interesting car is the uh, the 1921 Benz Mercedes. Uh, this car is currently owned by Jay Leno. Um, so if you Google search this, I'm sure you'll find this on YouTube. Um, but years ago, it was the uh, nickname, the, the Chitty Chitty Bang Bang car. Uh, it was owned by Peter Helk, who was the famed uh, 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 illustrator. Uh, this is Mr. Helk uh, with the car in the 60s. Um, and he winds up sending it down to uh, to Jim Ho in Connecticut to have the engine work done. He was a uh, Duesenberg specialist. And then uh, Gus Ryder to have all the body repairs done. Um, it's a great, uh, you know, just, uh, you know, tested, testament to Gus that Peter mentions him again by name uh, for restoring the work of rest restoring the car. And again, this is a great a handwritten letter from Helk to Gus. Um, it says, you'll uh, enclose, please find the check for the big, the, the big Benz Mercedes. Um, I don't have the check copy of it. I wish, I wish I had more details on what was done, but Gus did keep the letter from Mr. Helk. Um, so again, we knew it came down to the Bronx. Uh, and this is the car kind of, this was when Leonard brought it to, uh, uh, this is a different car, excuse me. This is the 1916 uh, um, Crane Simplex. Leno also owns this car. This was um, in 2004 at Pebble Beach. Uh, but again, this car in the 60s was, was owned by Melbourne Brindle. Uh, he was another illustrator uh, and um, um, artist. He was famous for drawing a series of uh, uh, Rolls Royce uh illustrations uh, again he's got that um connecticut license plate again the vanity plate brin b-r-i-n for brindle uh he lived in new canaan uh again this is him taking the car out to uh one of the meets again he would show this car um to as much as he could and again here it is in the bronx <laughs> seems that everything seems to end here it is in the bronx um again don't know what was done to it did it need paint did it need some did it need a new top um but you'll see that's the b-r-i-n um on the car um and it's here uh, down with Gus in the Bronx to be worked on. Um, another great car I love is the uh, Maharaja Duesenberg. Uh, this is currently owned by General William Lyon out in California. You'll notice that the uh, the colors, usually on the Maharaja cars, they're all orange with a, the black uh, top set color. Um, but that was actually switched years ago. Um, this car was featured in the 1963 issue of the Classic Car Magazine uh, when William, when Bill Bruce, uh, Brewster owned it, who lived in Stonington, Connecticut. Um, again, another outstanding picture of the car. Um, uh, here you see Bill has it. Uh, Mr. Brewster with Mr. Jim Ho did the engine work on it. Um, he's got the Dews Connecticut license plate, uh, which is, again, another great vanity plate to identify it. Um, but here uh, it is uh, in without its body in the Bronx. Again, you'll see the orange um the wheel insert here great pick great looking car but even without the uh, the body i think another when lena was uh, notorious for uh driving these cars the duesenbergs around with no top uh, no body on out in, out in california and you can notice little changes on the sign they've now got reuters written on top um of the building um 4067 now from the glass is on the is on the building itself so just small little ornate changes uh over the years uh, this is the engine for that uh, Maharaja Duesenberg. Uh, and again, now this is the original color. So Brewster wanted to keep it in tradition of uh, the Maharaja cars. And Gus said, you're not going to like it. So Brewster said, paint it. So Gus did, brings Brewster down, sees it, and says, Gus, you're right. Let's reverse it, which is why it now has the, the black body and then the orange trim on the top, which is, um, this is originally how it was going to be painted in 62. Uh, and then it's reversed uh, on Gus's suggestion. Uh, another great car is the uh, Type uh, 1959 Bugatti. Um, here it is in the picture of Sports Cars Illustrated. Um, it's owned by um, F.H. Luddington of uh, Pelham Manor um, in the Bronx. I mean, uh, in um, Pelham Manor, New York. Um, yeah, again, it still wears the European uh, license plate. You see it here pulling into the Bronx, into the shop. Uh, here it is pulled into the shop. Uh, again, don't know what was done to it. Wish I had more, a little more detail for you, but we know it's here to, to have work done on it. Um, and another great, you know, one of a kind sports car in the Bronx. Uh, this is the American Underslung, also owned by Mr. Luddington. 
Uh, again, a great picture of the car without the uh, without the body on it. Again, it's got the uh, license plates. So I'm able to track some things down through the license plates. But again, you just don't see cars without the body on them anymore. That is not me like that. So another unique shot to see um, of the uh, of the car. Um, unfortunately, Gus Sr. passes away in 1959. Um, again, it's just a unique piece to have the death certificate. Um, uh, again, with the address listed as Boston Post Road. Um, again, mail, um, where they're living. You just, you know, it's harder to get these things. Can't, ha you know, can't get them. Um, harder to come by. So just another piece of ephemera from, uh, uh, my battery's running low. Hold on. Sorry. Quick. Sorry about that. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, so just another unique piece to have uh, from the uh, from the family. Um, I did get a bunch of different um, letters from uh, people that Gus saved. This one is from a great one from Mr. Pants. So his name is George Stewart, and he owns uh, he, he owned a successful dry cleaning business in the city. Um, and he was especially known as Mr. Pants. Um, so going along with the letter, I'm trying to match a bunch of the cars to it. Uh, so this is Mr. Stewart's Rolls Royce. Um, you'll see it's got some work being done to it. The emblem is off. Um, there looks like they're painting something. They're covering the tires. Um, and then this is Mr. Stewart with his two daughters, uh, which is interesting. The the photo that she is holding, they never actually get. I I had this. I wanted making a copy and sending it to his daughter. She was thrilled. She hadn't seen it in you know forty years, thirty years. Uh, she couldn't believe I still had it. Uh, it's now framed at their house. You know, the daughter loves it. The family loves it. It's just, you know, a unique thing that you can kind of share on again uh, from over the years. And then this is the uh, the car uh, at at, uh, at Hershey. Uh, and we know it's uh, Mr. Stewart's car because it's got his wife's name on it. Lynn 8 was his vanity plate for it. And again, the paint job is incredible on this car. Uh, again, they did a, you know, award-winning job on this Rolls Royce. Uh, another great car is the 1926 Cunningham, not the Briggs Cunningham car, but just the Cunningham car. Uh, and this is a touring car that went to auction a couple of years ago. Again, it still has the Restored by Rotis Coachwork tag in it, which everyone's looking for. So the price went up. Um, and then here it is in the shop. Uh, so it looks like it's going to be painted here. Um, they've got some stuff over it, uh, but it just not don't have the details of what exactly was done. But we know work was done on it because it's it's in the shop. Um in addition to working for clients, uh, the British Coachworks did work for two uh, presidential cars. This first one is the uh, FDR's Packard 12. Um, it is now at the Toyota Museum in Japan. I do not know how it's got there. I'm still looking at that one, but it's it's in Japan. Um, we've got some neighbors who went to Japan, and I was you know anxious to them to go to the museum to take some pictures for me, but they didn't make it. Um, but this is the car as it sits today. Uh, and this is the car as it sat uh, in the 60s after getting work done. Um, I don't know how the, the FDR people or the museum or, uh, picked Gus, again, through word of mouth, but uh, it came here to the, the the Bronx to have work done on it. Uh, you'll see it still wears that, um, that light on the front fender there. Uh, and then this is Gus Sr., uh, Jr., and Uncle Eddie outside of it after it's done, again, here in the Bronx. Uh, this next one is Woodrow Wilson's Pierce Arrow 66. This is a shot of the car in Staunton, Virginia, uh, as it sits today. What's interesting is to notice it still wears the original license plate, the 2350 from Virginia. Um, uh, and when I contacted the museum, I, I had asked them if they had changed plates, and they said no. Um, and we know it went down to the Bronx. Uh, There's a great article. Um, it says visitors will have to do without seeing one of the most popular attractions. Uh, because Gus Reuter of Reuters Coachworks in the Bronx will estimate the problems in restoration. So it was shipped up here by rail uh, for a couple of weeks to have Gus take a look at, so you could not see it uh, at the museum in Virginia. Uh, here it is outside of uh, the Coachworks. Again, it still wears that 2350 plate. Again, I made sure I verified that. This is saying it's in 63, so the date's right. So they shipped this thing up um, to have a look at for Gus uh, to do some work on. Uh, and they shipped it by rail. So this is a great shot of the car coming off of the rail the railroad track in the Bronx. Um, it's an incredible shot. Again, it still wears that original license plate, so we know it's the right car. Um, and then this is the guys after they get it off. 
uh, unloading it off uh, the rail car um, onto the onto the road here. So it looks like it was a uh, tough tough sledding for these three guys to get it out, but they did, uh, and they got it uh, back to the uh, to the shop. Uh, another client was Ed Jurist, who ran the uh, vintage car store in Nyack, New York. Um, Jurist was a longtime um, seller of classic and vintage automobiles. Uh, this is a great shot of the sign um, that I acquired over the years. Uh, this is Mr. Jurist here outside of the store, um, again, with one of his uh, cars out front. I think it's a Bentley. Uh, and this great shot, I think, that Gus took from inside the uh, vintage car store because you can see it on the glass. So you'll see here it says vintage car store from the inside. Again, this is a Rolls here in front. Uh, did a lot of work uh, with Ed. You know, Ed would find a car, send it to Gus, have it, you know, worked on, and then, and then it would be, uh, and then Ed would sell it. So a very good customer and client over the years. Um, I really love the uh, the letters from over the years. This is from Cornelia Shields, who worked on Wall Street years ago. Um, again, just sent him a letter with some old uh, pictures from, uh, I think, from Peter Helk. Um, I actually wound up contacting Cornelius' uh, Shield's son, uh, who actually wrote me back in, so this, this is dated 62. Uh, his son wrote me back in 2016 um, saying uh, he really, uh, Gus really liked the work that he did on his father's 1950 Mercedes. Uh, the car was a treasure of his, um, the Bentley as well. Uh, he had a Thunderbird and uh, a Mercedes-Benz Cabriolet as well. So again, it's, it was reaching out not only to the original customers, but trying to track down family members to see what they have, um, because you never know what you find uh, over the years. Uh, another great one is uh, the Rolls-Royce uh, uh, Rolls that was 1926 that was run, owned by R.L. Atwell in Texas. Uh, he ran the classic car showcase. Um, and the story goes, he, he tried other restores in Texas and other places and didn't like them. So he would ship all his cars to New York, to the Bronx, to have them worked on. Um, and you'll see as the car went to auction a few years ago, it still has that restored by Reuters tag on it, has never been taken off. Um, Atwell really loved the work that was done on it. And here's the car leaving uh, once it was done to go back to Atwell. Again, you'll see the Reuters Coachwork sign on the building. Then American Spring Welding, welding start uh, to that business on the, on the side. Again, just a great looking shot during the day of it. Here's Gus with the uh, the driver um, uh, outside the, the coach books again as this car is getting ready to, uh, to head off back to Atwell. Uh, this is an interesting, uh, it's a 1921, uh, 29 Murphy body Duesenberg. What's interesting about this car is it, uh, I think it's restored a couple of times by uh, Reuter over the years. The first time here in the Bronx, and then I think, uh, again, when the, the, the business moves to Ridgefield, Connecticut, it's the same car, I'll go back, um, but once it's restored uh, in the Bronx, and then again in Connecticut. So you've got Gus uh, Jr. here. This is Robert Reuter on the right, Richard Reuter, my father-in-law behind, and Jim Kovacs on the left. Uh, uh, so now just other pictures uh, of, the, of the shop. There's, you know, I don't know exactly what car this one is, but it's still, someone put that restored by Ritter's tag on it. This is some kind of a carriage, looks like. Um, this is the uh, 1933 Packard Dietrich. Uh, it's a little torn, but just, I love this photo because see how long the car is. Uh, see how much space it actually takes up. Um, but it's just, again, unique looking car, really fantastic. Um, this is the uh, the Brewster Town uh, Lanolette, 1916. This car, I believe, is on the Cape, um, but again, came through the Bronx, uh, came through for Gus to have to do some work on it. Um, again, so I'm not sure if this is the the before or after shot of it. Looks all right here. I'm not sure if it just has to be cleaned up on it. Um, but again, uh, not all the photos are dated. Um, not not a lot of inventory for what was done. But again, we know the cars are there because we've got the photographic record. Uh, this is a 1930s Laganda outside, uh, ready for someone to be picked up. Uh, another unique looking car. Uh, this is a 1937 Jaguar. It's got Florida plates on it. Um, so not sure who owned that one, but trying to track that one down as well. Uh, this is another Rolls Royce. Uh, having worked on, I'm trying to see if I can track down the uh, the New York license plate. Again, Connecticut, New York, um, kept very good uh, automotive uh, records. Uh, especially when it comes to license plates. Uh, but now with, you know, the privacy concerns, it's tracking them down is harder, but um, I'm still trying to uh, do my best to get them. Uh, this is actually Al Capone's 1940 Cadillac. 
Um, the, this is an interesting car. It's at the uh, Collins Museum in, in Massachusetts, in Stowe, Mass. What's interesting about this is that there is literature that um, the car did have a restoration done by Gus Ryder in New York. I don't have pictures of it in the uh, at the shop in the Bronx, but again, another. Uh, this was in the glove compartment of the car as it uh, was sold at auction. Uh, so this was mentioned that the restoration was done by Gus. Um, hoping it's true. Uh, still looking to confirm that one, but again, uh, you know, it's uh, it's 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 out there, uh, and you know another Cadillac for you uh, outside of the shop uh, with another New York license plate on it. Uh, more Cadillacs. There's just so many great cars that came through here. Um, again, some of these cars are one of one. Uh, another carriage that's being worked on. I uh, don't know who the owner of this one is, but just unique automobiles that that come through the shop. Uh, nice uh, Mercedes Cabriolet. You know, wouldn't it be nice to have this car nowadays? Uh, I'm sure the price thing is uh, this one skyrocketed. I can't quite read the license plate on it, and I haven't identified who uh, is with Gus here in this shop. But again, outstanding looking car. Uh, one of one of one kind of Mercedes, uh, really unique. Uh, this is a uh, uh, Packer. This is owned by Steve Billet, uh, also a New Yorker. Um, what's great about this car is that not only do, do we have this photo that survives, but uh, Steve's son was gracious to send me the the invoice for it. So uh, it's, uh, uh, his dad loved Gus so much, loved all the work that he did, that he couldn't bear to throw any receipts away. So this is dated 1958, uh, again, with the Coachworks invoice, uh, what was done to it, paid, signed by Gus, you know, just really invaluable piece of information um, when putting together, you know, the history of the Coachworks. Uh, just another uh, uh, letterhead that I kept from over the years. Uh, again, just it's a nice reminder of, who Gus was and what you would have gotten from him, whether it was Austin Clark or letters. There's actually a couple of letters from Gus in the Henry Ford Museum out in Dearborn um, that I'm trying to track down as well. Uh, this is uh, 1966 ad. So you see little has changed, just the border around the ad. Uh, so again, they really weren't putting too much pizzazz in what they were um, you know, trying to advertise with. They were letting their quality of work speak for themselves. Um, and then as uh, Gus, Gus Jr.'s sons got older, this is Rich here on the right with the glasses and Rob on the left. They began working for their father. Uh, so they're working on some, you know, incredible cars over the years as well. This is from 1968. I believe Rich starts working for his dad in 65 and then uh, Rob a couple of years later. Uh, this is, uh, they're featured in Holiday Magazine in 1970. Um, this is an Alpine Rolls Royce behind him. So again, not a huge shop, um, but this is you know the kind of work that they produced. Uh, they get to work on another Rolls Royce. Don't know who won this one, um, but you know I'm sure it came out at, you know an, an A plus award winner. Um, and this is another Rolls that was won by um, Dr. Shear that went to uh, uh, it was sold to Mr. Atwell. So you'll see the old 20 license plate on it. Uh, again, unique looking car. Um, other cars I still can't identify. I'm still trying to figure out what car this one is. Um, I think that might be Austin Clark's uh, Pierce on the left. Um, same with these two. <laughs> there's so many cars that went through here and there's so many photos. They're just so unique because, you know, the, the, these brands, the makes of these cars are gone now. They, they're no longer around. You know, these kind of one of one kind of cars, uh, really unique uh, history to have. Uh, so, they stay in the Bronx until 1970 when they're lured up to Ridgefield, Connecticut by uh, Dr. Peter Williamson. Williamson builds a new kind of state-of-the-art facility for them. Uh, Williamson's a big car collector. Uh, he actually owns the uh, Bugatti Atlantic um, that winds up selling, I think, in 2004 for a record amount at the time. It's now out in the Mullen Museum in California. Uh, it's a really unique looking car. Uh, again, Rich and Rob continue to, to do work uh, some fantastic work in Ridgefield over the years uh, with their father. Um, again, this is the Packard in front here. This is the um, uh, Duesenberg here body that they're working on. Um, so again, they kept that spirit. They kept the quality with them as they went to uh, to Connecticut. This is Williamson's other Bugatti. So he was a uh, you know, big collector and really enticed them to move up. Uh, and again, produced, you know, second to none work uh, up and unfortunately until 1986 when Gus uh, Jr. passes away. Um, so a lot of the stories go with him, um, and, you know, but, you know, up until then the work, you know, survived, um, fortunately, uh, the building and imprint are still in the Bronx. So you're looking at the old Reuters coach works. 
So it's now auto options um, and the apartment is still there. The door here is still here. So the, the business is still there. The imprint's still there. Um, I wound up taking my daughter a few years ago, our oldest daughter down there. So you'll see the backside of the shop, the door and the apartment where they would, would have lived uh, above. And then that's our daughter uh, across the street just to get a different view of, of what's now the coach work. So this is technically, uh, this is Gus's great, great granddaughter. So, you know, it's great to have that with her coach work shirt on. Um, so the, the building's still there. Maybe you could get some kind of historical designation uh, one of these years. Um, but just, you know, impressive, fascinating stuff that they were able to work on uh, and write all in the Bronx. Thank you very much. Really, really great talk, John. I, I love the, the FDR uh, Packard. Yeah, uh, what a what what a sad sign of the decline and fall with the ugly BMWs. Oh yeah, <laughs> where, where, where it is now. But really, really wonderful. Um, thank you for uh, giving a very very uh, interesting talk. No problem. Um, I'm going to turn it over to our audience. Um, so John Daly asks, uh, did the family have any of their own collector cars? And I think I I had read it that they didn't they couldn't afford them, which is very depressing. Yeah, no, they, 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 as they moved into Ridgefield, they had a couple, they had a couple of gold wings uh, and others, oh, and they had to sell them, uh, unfortunately, over the years. Uh, so they did dabble in a couple, um, but then, no, then they got rid of what they had. And, to, and you don't know how they got in contact with Woodrow Wilson and FDR. It was just word of mouth because their work was so fine. Yeah, because I looked in the newspaper articles, it doesn't mention how, it just says when it when the car is going down. So because I guess, oh, I you know, yeah, either word of mouth or they knew someone else and you're, lo you're looking and there wasn't, I don't know if there are as many restoration shops as there are now. So if you're yeah. looking for that's, one and you get it. That's still, a, that's still a tremendous distance, though, to ship it all the way up from Virginia. But that's, that's a testament to their work, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, Vivian Young ask any idea exactly why they left the, the Bronx yeah so they were enticed to come up to uh, Ridgefield through uh, uh Dr. Williamson built them a shop in uh in Ridgefield so they they moved from the Bronx in 1970 up to uh, Ridgefield so still close enough to New York that they you know the clients still went with them so they didn't it's not like they're moving to Florida or something although right. uh, was it Milton Milton uh did try to get Gus Sr. to move to Florida when he opened the Autorama he was so enamored with uh Gus's work he did all he could uh, to get him to move down, uh, but Gus wind up ultimately declining. What was the story of um, Gus Senior? Where did he he immigrate from? Lithuania, you said. From Germany. From Germany, and uh, can you t talk about the first generation and how he got into the business in the first place? So he uh, well, he was a uh, you know he started working when he was fourteen uh, over over in Germany. And, you know, becomes a trimmer and he's learning from all these, you know, he's essentially an apprentice working from all these great masters. And then when he comes here and then starts the business in 29 during the Depression, he has his pick of who he's going to hire because everyone's out of work. Uh, and he had, would, have been, had, would have worked with some of these guys, either at Gotham or other places around New York, that when he starts it, he's got he's picking the kind of cream of the crop. So as the as the work comes in, it's great. A that's why I think Zumbach winds up helping him survive by giving them a couple of clients, and then again just doubling the price. So they survived the depression, which maybe they shouldn't have. Uh, but then from there, again meeting, you know the, the 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 good fortune of Zumbach not taking that receipt out and Alec Goldman seeing it, bringing the cars there, and then from there it snowballs, kind of put them on the map to stay. Very interesting. Um, does anyone else have any questions in the group? And this will be recorded as well, so if, um, it'll be sent out to the full list of the people that signed up, even if some people couldn't make it tonight, and will later be posted on our uh, YouTube channel. So going once, does anyone have any further questions? Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, John. It's a really, really great presentation. And I encourage everyone to go on uh, the Bronx County Historical Society website um, to see more about our upcoming programs, um, our museums, the Valentine Varian House, the Museum of Bronx History on Bainbridge Avenue, and of course, the Edgar Allan Polk Cottage in Fordham. 
and it'll also have a whole list of a variety of things we do. Uh, thank you very much, John. Thanks. Appreciate it. Right, be well. Take care.